we get going. So what happens after I click buy or sell on my MD4? Well, uh, to answer that, uh, we'll have to make uh, differentiate according to the different types of providers, uh, such as brokers and broker dealers, um, because the, the answer is different in each of the cases. So we're going to liaise with uh, several subcases, starting with what in the simplest one, uh, when you click buy or sell a MetaTrader with a dealing desk uh, broker dealer or market maker with a pure broker or somebody who, who only acts as an agent on behalf of customers, uh, the way, for instance, Darwinex does. Uh, on exchange, if in the case where we're talking about not over-the-counter products, but um, exchange-listed products such as perhaps uh, futures or, um, or even stocks. And then by all means, as I said, uh, there's, there'll be plenty of jargon and, and stuff today. So there's no stupid questions uh, asked, uh, only stupid answers. So do, do not hesitate to, to go ahead uh, and because uh, it would be a failure if you left this webinar with unanswered questions relating to, to the topic of today. Uh, Guy is asking if there'll be a recording and the answer is yes. Uh, it's all being recorded and uh, I think it goes out automatically to anybody who signed up to it. Also, uh, I shall mention that um, we, for, for the recordings and so on, uh, an easier option might be to subscribe to our YouTube channel uh, where we upload all videos and you'll be updated automatically um, of uh, whenever there's any, any new update. Plus, you can also comment and ask more questions. So to find that, just Google DarwinX YouTube. I'm very happy to say we're now approaching a thousand uh, subscribers, which which is a ton more. I don't know if that's much or not because I haven't checked what typical subscribers and channels are, but it certainly is a ton more than we had a couple of months ago. Uh, so uh, it seems like uh, people are finding that um, a good option. Okay, so let's get going. So uh, let's start with what you see: uh, an MT4 terminal. Uh, that what what the, the the end customer sees, and obviously you click buy or sell, and uh, boom, you know. Uh, you get the nice sound and you get a confirmation but how on earth did that confirmation get there well we're going to see that so uh i borrowed this uh, infographic from uh, metacodes's site uh, basically what you can see is here is the basic front office which is whatever the customer sees uh, you can trade on a mobile terminal on iphone or or android or you can use the desktop application uh, yeah. Meanwhile, also, there's a web application, which, which wasn't there when I did the infographic. Uh, but behind the scenes, there's, of course, the MetaTrader 4 server. And uh, there's a number of things that go on there. And uh, that's the, the topic of today. So let's get going. Now, if it's a dealing desk, as you know, I like to use prov provocative images. Basically, there's you, the small child, sending a trading request to, to the market. And uh, what happens then, well, the, the market or the dealing desk in this case, is you click then you issue a trade request uh, that travels via the internet to the MT4 server, depending on where you are in the world and how good your internet connectivity is. It could be anything between 50 and 100 milliseconds. And uh, at some point, two things happen if you're uh, trading with a dealer. So uh, the order request could be accepted, in which case you've got a trade, or it could be uh, rejected, uh, in which case you would get a requote with another updated price offered by the dealer at which the dealer would be willing to trade, which you can then accept or uh, reject. So that's really the two options. Uh, assuming the trade was accepted, uh, this is very simple. So uh, all, all there is is an accounting entry in MetaTrader 4 server, whereby your account is credited with the with uh, basically the, 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 the trade you requested. And then uh, there's an equal but opposite sign entry in the, uh, in the risk book run by the dealer so that he can uh, basically know what sort of risk uh, he, he's got um, open. That's pretty much all there is to it. The only system involved in all this is uh, MetaTrader 4, the terminal on your side and the server on the dealer side. And uh, I have uh, the, the important thing here is that this is the way that MT4 is designed to work. It, it just uh, wasn't conceived to work in, in any other way. It, in, in, in other words, it's really not different from anything you would do at uh, you know bet and win or any any gambling uh, platforms because that's really what we're talking about. It's a, a two-sided bet where you're one on one side of the bet and the dealer is on the other side uh, with the only difference of the spread. Okay, so that was simple, wasn't it? Uh, well, so um, 
Of course, and this is one question that that got immediately triggered after after I posted this slide uh, on, the, on the Spanish one was okay. So how about slippage? Where where does slippage enter this equation? And uh, the answer is okay. Well, slippage is uh, let's clarify it. So the, the slippage could be the possibility that the trade at which you requested the trade and um, the, the price at which you requested the trade and the price at which it was filled differed. So why? Could they differ? Uh, is this a scam or, or, or what? And the answer is, it's not necessarily a scam uh, because there's something that you have to factor in, and that is as follows. So the price that you see now on your MT4 uh, at any point in time left the MT4 server of any dealer about, as I said, 50 to 100 milliseconds um, before you saw it. And then, of course, uh, if you click the button, then the trade request will travel for another 50 to 100 seconds so that uh, the, basically there's a time lag from the point where you trade at a certain price until the the order reaches the market where a new uh, possibly different prevailing price might be, might be there. And in, in that setup, the dealer is faced with... Uh, three choices so the first one is to pass on the slippage to you or the difference in price to you uh, but presumably he will not like to do that because uh, that for some people seems to be a bad thing to to have so uh, that's option that's not even on the card here the other two options would be okay the price has moved uh, moved against the customer in which case he might accept to fill at the former price because he knows he's booking a riskless profit uh, immediately or the price might have moved against the dealer but because he wants uh, he wants you to stay with him and doesn't want any bad press he'll basically accept that loss knowing that over time hopefully the wins and losses average out and uh, there's no point going into arguments uh, which brings us to uh, scalping. So how do dealers spot uh, a scalper or ban uh, systematic winners? Well, exactly because if you know that dealers do this, then you can try to systematically exploit this by uh, entering trades uh, from pretty close to the server at a, at a price, which is whenever the price is moved in your, in your favor. And uh, of course, the dealers have teams that check that out. And uh, if they see that uh, your your account, uh, you know, systematically wins in the cases of slippage, then you might get uh, problems in, in those cases. Typically, what will happen will be that uh, a broker dealer will stop being a dealer and that uh, market giving you the, the the liquidity or are creating the market for you, and they will become a broker where they they hedge the positions with the market and uh, and the the issue goes away. Which basically brings us to the second way in which MetaTrader can work. And importantly, a MetaTrader, uh, you see there's a circle down here in the MetaTrader 4 gateway. So a gateway or the, the bridge is an extension that has been built into MetaTrader to connect, which is what is in, a, in essence a closed loop system, uh, MetaTrader 4, with the, bro uh, the, the global over-the-counter uh, spot for an exchange market where all the large counterparties uh, ca can be found. And this gateway or bridge or whatever is a piece of software which essentially changes the way that MetaTrader 4 uh, works. And this is where the, the, the alphabet soup starts. So uh, we, we would be talking about electronic communications networks, uh, direct market access, and uh, a lot of uh, hula baloo. Uh, please, uh, if I don't manage to, to explain it properly, uh, stop me, ask me again, and I will try and, uh, and do it. So, but in essence, what is an electronic communications network? Well, it's nothing else other than a piece of software that uh, aggregates a bunch of price quotes offered by N banks. So the banks essentially say, well, I'm going to trade at, uh, on the bid side at price X and on the ask side at, at price Y. Uh, you've got 20 banks who are doing that simultaneously. And there's a software that basically takes the prices by all those banks and creates a composite uh, order book where all the prices are ranked in, the, in ascending or descending order, depending on whether we're on the bid or on the ask side. But importantly, the, the trading happens in, in parallel. So everybody's trading with everybody uh, directly as opposed to with a central counterparty, the way it happens on an exchange. And that, which might seem trivial, has huge implications for the quality uh, of execution that you experience. 
So there's a question here that I'm starting to see. So Rafael asked, is it true that the broker opens a trade against the dealer? Uh, if this is the case, does the broker lose money when the trader wins and vice versa? And the answer is yes. So it's a two-sided bet. There can only be one winner uh, if we're talking about the, uh, a dealer. Uh, ultimately, uh, there's always two sides to a trade. So if one side wins, the other one loses. Uh, but with a retail dealer, you have uh, no middleman in, in between both. With a, with a dealer, you've got the, the trader trading against the dealer directly. The dealer knows who the trader is. The dealer knows how much uh, balance the or margin the, the trader has in his account. He also knows the trade history by the trader. So he's got a lot of information letting him know uh, how how to basically trade the different uh, trades. But ultimately, of course, it's, it's always the trader who chooses to trade the way he trades. So the responsibility is, is with, the, with the trader. Okay, so I got sidetracked there. So we were talking about electronic communications network, and what we've got is this piece of software that aggregates the prices, competing prices, by the different liquidity providers, and basically tells you, okay, the best price on the bid side, bid side would be, say, by J.P. Morgan. So that's where uh, you want your order to go, because obviously you want you want to trade at the best possible price. And that brings us to our uh, liquidity provider and technology ecosystem. I mean, I did the hopefully most possibly simplified version of this, where there's, in the case of Darwin X, the MT4 server, obviously you would be here on the left-hand side, so there's the customer who's sending stuff to the MT4 server, and then because we're a broker, uh, we do not trade against our customers directly, uh, uh, but what we do is we basically send the customer's order to the, mar the market via the bridge. So at this point, there's Elma, uh, we have two prime brokers. There's uh, Elmax Prime and uh, Saxo Prime, each of whom is connected to about 20 uh, different uh, banks and uh, give or take 10 non-bank liquidity providers who are all competing to offer the best price because obviously if they if they succeed, they can always pocket more spread than if they don't. And um, and uh, th this whole thing is done by a piece of software that offered by, uh, in, in our case, uh, the bridge provider Prime XM. Okay. So what goes on then? Well, uh, how, how are the orders matched? Well, essentially, of course, nothing changes here. You send, you, you do click, then your order request still travels via the internet from MT4 terminal to MT4 server for about 100 milliseconds. Uh, but then what happens is it reaches MetaTrader 4 server and then MetaTrader 4 via the bridge sends a trade request to, um, to, the, the, to the bridge that then basically sees uh, the, the best offer on the bid or on the ask by all the L competing LPs and then matches the, the trade in one or several legs. So it could be if you send that one lot trade, then very like, more likely than not, it will be filled instantly by a single liquidity provider. If you do send, uh, say, you know, 500 lot trade, then uh, uh, it's more likely that the trade might get broken up in several legs and uh, those legs might be filled with different uh, liquidity providers, but ultimately the fill price that you see for your, say, 500 lots would be the weighted average price that each of the legs uh, got um, for, you know, for, from the different liquidity providers. So what accounting entry takes place in that situation? Well, obviously, there'll be your position in your account. This doesn't change anything. And then uh, a broker like us offering MetaTrader 4 on a match principle basis will have two opposing positions. So we, on the one hand, will trade against you uh, in a so-called uh, dealing book. So we will do just what a dealer does. But then at the same time, we will enter an equal and opposite position uh, in the prime broker account. So we're acting, which makes us a, a pure intermediary that takes the order to the LP, who is the other party that takes uh, the opposite of your position. So you see, so there's your position, you've got net risk on your side, we've got minus plus, which hedge out, and then there's the LP who's taking the, the opposite side of your, of your trade. Ultimately, it's the same thing, but there's a number of differences. The first one is, of course, that we, as the middleman, uh, are here to provide a service. We charge you a commission for the service of sourcing the liquidity, and our interests are strictly and squarely with, uh, with you, because uh, the, the more you win, the more volume you do, the more commission you can pay us in the long run. If you lose, uh, in the short run, it, we don't really care because uh, your loss is not our loss. It would be the the, um, 
uh, or our win. It would be the LP's win. But of course, in the long run, uh, the, the second run effects mean that we don't want losing customers because when they go, uh, our business goes with them. So, uh, yeah, it might sound like the same thing, but it gives rise to a completely opposite set of incentives. Uh, another benefit of this is, of course, the fact that the prime broker is trading or the, the, the LP is trading not against you. They're trading against us. So your identity is hidden behind DarwinX's identity. So provided DarwinX has as many winners as, they, as we have losers and we neither win nor lose from the market, then LPs will still continue to be willing to provide liquidity to the winners that are with our next. Now, long term, if uh, and this is one of my long term concerns, I have to admit, uh, as, as Darwin X, once more and better Darwins join and uh, their their size becomes the, of the good Darwins becomes bigger and bigger as a proportion of the total flow we send, then you know we might get into issues because uh, of course if Goldman Sachs sees that every trade they enter against us is a losing trade, they might actually consider widening the spread. But um, don't worry, guys, we're still far from that situation. And I think it's nice to know that we're all together in, 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 that, uh, in that ship. Uh, and also, you, you should know, of course, that the, 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 the journey doesn't stop there because, of course, Goldman Sachs does not always warehouse the risk. So they're, uh, they're obviously hedging the, the positions in the, in the background as well. So it may well uh, be that the, the net wins, consistent net wins by one player uh, are sort of... Um, uh, just a drop in the ocean, and uh, it doesn't really affect un until we get seriously big. Uh, Vlad is saying that would be a nice problem to have, uh, and my answer is that will be a nice problem to have. Uh, I just look forward to the time when we approach that. I, I have to say the, the investor uh, platform is, is going along nicely. Uh, the numbers are still small, but the growth rate is quite substantial. So uh, we'll get there, guys. Anyway, so let's get get going. Now, key terms that we that we need to clarify today. So the first one is uh, matching by price versus matching orders, and this is the key difference between an ECN and an organized exchange. So we'll we'll come back to that in a, in a second. Then there's the the issue of a slippage being a structural element of of trading. So the we do get. A fair amount of requests per, per week, I have to I have to say, where people are complaining that we are a bucket shop because they have experienced um, slippage. And uh, what I'd like to explain today is that if you didn't explain, uh, if you do not experience slippage, then chances are uh, you're not trading in the real market. Uh, so I'll explain. Uh, then uh, I think understanding both will will explain the differences between an ECN versus a, a market, uh, like a proper. Um, order book where orders are, are matched and last but not least there's the the issue of uh, last look versus no last look which is one of those which um it takes a while to understand but it's also quite quite interesting and it's, it's one that plagues the the retail forex market by quite a bit so uh now this is a, a key concept to differentiate um uh, because we're, that, that's the difference between limit orders and indicative prices. So we, we have to understand the difference between a liquidity taker, which is what you are as a customer trading with, with MT4, and a liquidity provider, which is what say, Goldman Sachs would be doing at the other end of the, uh, of the trade. So uh, as a liquidity tra uh, taker, the best you can do, essentially, or especially with MT4, which, is, uh, which, which does not support all order, uh, all order types, is to request that your volume is filled at the best price. So you can you basically get to say, I want to trade one lot, and you do set the quantity of one lot, but you cannot set the quantity of uh, the of uh, the, the, the price because the price is not decided by you; it's decided by by the the market essentially. So that's what you are as liquidity uh, taker. You know the volume will get filled, but you don't know at what price. Uh, as a provider, it's the other way around. You set the price, so you say, I'm only willing to offer. Uh, so to enter into the trade if this particular tr price is, is hit uh, and I'm offering to trade for this much volume. So the unknown here is not the price, but the volume. Whereas here, the unknown is the price, not uh, the known is the volume, assuming we're talking about small, small, uh, small enough volumes, uh, but the unknown is the price. So is the, do you guys see the difference? Because that, that's, uh, that's going to have an implication for later. Um, so there's a question here by Rafael asking about uh, scalping and, and so on. Um, and he's 
So Rafael, I mean, if, you, if you're doing scalping and you think time is of the essence, then you might possibly want to be hosted in Equinix, um, in Equinix LD4 in, in London because the, you, you will save, uh, yeah, uh, tens of milliseconds. I don't know how many, but uh, certainly tens. And uh, that might be, I don't know if that's relevant or not for your strategy, but certainly if, if that's so important, you could, you could try that. Okay, so we talked about the liquidity take a liquidity provider, and uh, then um, Rafael, I'll, I'll, you've got all very interesting questions. I'll, I'll come back to to those in a, in a second. So uh, let's, if if I haven't answered them by the end of the webinar, we can we've always got a Q and A at, at the end that we can cover them. So let's keep going. So we, we talked about the difference between liquidity taker and liquidity provider, and now we get to see the order book in the in the market. So as you can see, there's not one price here. What there are is there's an order book with market depth on the bid and on the offer side, okay? And as you see, the more volume we want to trade, so and this is cumulative, so if you wanted to trade 2.9 um, million on the bid, we would do it at uh, 1.2653. And these are just made up numbers that I took a while ago. Now, if we wanted to do more, uh, say we could do uh, up to say 5.4, uh, where the first 2.9 would be done at the price at the top and the second 2.5 would be done at the point uh, the price at the bottom. And as we go down in the order book, you see the price gets worse and worse. And uh, similarly, if we were on the other side, uh, it goes up and gets worse and worse. So there's not one price, but there's one price for a volume. This brings us to the concept of volume weighted average price, which is another way of uh, describing slippage. So if I want to trade at the top of book where there's say up to 500, uh, like half a million, then I know the spread is 0 0.1. But if I want to trade say 10 million, then the spread for 10 million is not 0 0.1, but 0 0.3. I've been slipped by 0 0.2 pips uh, as I grew the volumes. Okay, so why does slippage happen in, 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 in here? So for two reasons. The first one is because of the time lag. This thing, you can't see right now here live, but I'm just going to check. Uh, so uh, I'm just going to see if we can see the live, uh, live feed from uh, one of our LPs. So there you go. You can see it here with some market depth, so you see it's moving all the time. So of, of course, this is not a fully, uh, like this doesn't update every every millisecond, but the real thing actually does. So you see, uh, you know, if, if you take a bit longer to send the price, the price has already moved. So one, that's one of the reasons why there is slippage. So that's a random movement around the price that you want. And then the other one is systematic slippage, which is what happens, say, when a big Darwin hits the market, uh, because you're actually cleaning the, the order book. So those are the two reasons for for, for slippage and, uh, and slippage has to do with the fact that orders are matched here. Uh, it's, it's all done on, on, on limit orders sent by for, for the matching in the, in the market. Uh, there's a question by Guy. Uh, Guy, I, I can take that up later. There's actually a webinar on that, but I'll remind me at the end of the webinar, and I'll, I'll teach you to tell how uh, that you that a broker does not trade against you. Uh, by the way, a broker, if it's a broker, it doesn't trade against you. But um, most so-called forex brokers are not real brokers. Okay, so let's keep going. Now, uh, so what's the difference between an ECN and an, an exchange or, a, or a, like a, a proper market? Well, uh, not much on, on the first level, but uh, um, there's a key difference, and that is as follows. In an ECN, everybody is trading against everybody. So if there's 20 banks and uh, 20 uh, retail guys on the left-hand side, the ECN will route the orders uh, so that uh, the best prices are always matched, but the trades will take place directly between the participants. So if they say Vlad on the left-hand side and Goldman Sachs on the right-hand side, then Vlad and Goldman Sachs will be trading with each other directly. In an organized market, there's a central counterparty that acts as the other side to everyone's trades. So in, say, in an organized market, uh, like a, a multilateral trading facility, which is an exchange for, for an exchange, which, which is what LMAX is, then Vlad would trade against LMAX, and LMAX would simultaneously trade against Goldman Sachs, 
but Vlad would not know that Goldman Sachs was at the other uh, side of the trade, and Goldman Sachs would not know that Vlad uh, was uh, the, the, the real counterparty. It's all anonymous, and everybody uh, hides their own identity behind the centralized counterparty. And that has a lot of implications because uh, you cannot use the fact that you know who's on the other side to your benefit. In an ideal world, and if you ask me, I think this is what will happen eventually in two, three, four years' time. Uh, by the way, the, the wind is blowing on the regulatory, uh, regulatory side. Uh, a lot of standardized assets will be forced on exchange. And I'm glad to uh, think, or I, I look forward to the time when um, when uh, Forex is, is also the case, where there will no longer be individual dealers who trade against their own customers directly, but rather all the volumes will be forced onto a centralized exchange where everybody is trading against everybody and everybody gets the same price, which is not the case uh, today. So that's a, a key difference. And then uh, there's the concept of uh, last look. What is last look? Well, let's say, I am a, um, I'm a, a bank and I've offered a certain price uh, to, to fill a certain volume, which is what a limit order is about. And, uh, and basically somebody takes my price and uh, requests to cross that volume. And then I basically look at the market price or I look at whatever and I say, you know what? I actually did offer uh, this volume at this price, but I thought better of it. So I'm going to pass on it. Uh, so I had a last look at the position and decided that it was no good for me. And the implication for the other counterparty is, of course, wasted time because uh, there's an opportunity cost in the situation. So I, uh, I, as a bank, basically took some time to receive the customer's order. Then I passed on it, which means the bridge will then take that order and offer that to all the other LPs. Uh, of course, time will have uh, passed. And of course, the order was rejected uh, presumably rejected in the first place because the price had moved against the LPs. So chances are there'll be uh, this. This will all result in a worse price than if I hadn't taken the 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 option of rejecting something to which I had committed previously. And uh, today uh, the forex markets work with last look. Um, there's a lot of arguments for and against. Of course, it depends on who you ask. If you ask the LPs, they say last look is uh, good because blah, blah, blah. Uh, and, but of course, if you ask the end customers, i.e. you and ultimately us ourselves, then I, it's not a good thing because you don't really have a certainty on whether what you see on a screen is actually true or just a mirage of, uh, of liquidity. Now, there is one way to tell. And the way to tell is, and sorry, I, I, this is left over from the Spanish one. This is a distribution of fill time in milliseconds. So like 100 milliseconds, 200 milliseconds and uh, and so on, and frequency of, uh, of trades. And I'm glad to report that we're just going to move over to another side of the, uh, to like a little study that we've done. We're now uh, implementing, as part of the, the standard toolkit that we offer every Darwin X user, an execution report where we show both the execution time in milliseconds that you can see here, which is generally well below 50 milliseconds. Let's just uh, have a look here. And you can see, uh, in as a summary, it's like all the times that the trades are closed uh, very, very fast. That's because the LPs did not use their, their prerogative of, of last look. But then you, ha you have these cases where things are delayed abnormally. And that's presumably because the order has bounced from LP to LP who rejected the trade until some, somebody eventually took it. And then, of course, that somebody eventually take, uh, taking it after, after a lot of time has passed may result in more slippage. So presumably, the situations where you see um, uh, adverse slippage against the, the customer are situations where the trade took a long time to fill uh, because the LPs rejected that sequentially. Did that make sense? So that, that, that's basically a way to tell whether there's a lot of last look going on. And then one thing that we pride ourselves in is trying to be very, very fast in uh, in filling the customer's orders, because that means there's less options, less cases of less extreme slippage uh, against the, the, the customer. So uh, obviously, th the, the charts will look nicer, but I think in the next month or so, uh, you, there will be a new section on the on the on the Darwin X user dashboard, uh, explaining for every trade in exactly how, millisec how many milliseconds it was uh, filled and uh, what slippage was there. So, uh, and for that, we will be using the 
database that we have from, from our bridge, which shows all the execution reports for every order. So there's a huge database in here where there's every trade ever taken by DarwinX. You see like this uh, one every couple of seconds, where, where you see the, 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 the instrument traded, the size of the trade, the price, what the prevailing bid and ask was when the, tra the, the trade request was set at that open time millisecond, uh, when it was done, how long it took in milliseconds, so in this case it would be four, and if there was any any slippage or, or not. So you see the distribution, in most cases there's no slippage, but sometimes there is, both positive and uh, negative. So there's a question here, does a limit order have always positive slippage with a DMA? Um, so if it's a limit order, so let's go back to the concept. That's very important. So a limit order is what you offer as a liquidity provider. So you're offering to fill a certain volume at a, at a definitely certain price. So if it really is a limit order and somebody takes it, then they cannot be slippage by definition because if, if it's not filled, so it will either filled, be filled or not filled. But if it is filled, it will be at the price that you request. So it, basically, the limit order and slippage are just uh, too, too impossible. They, they cannot coexist. What can happen, of course, is that you do not have slippage, but, you do, but what you do have is partial fills. But you will not be filled at a price different from what you expected, because that's what a limit order does. You, you set the price, and you're willing to bargain on the volume. Whereas as a, and that's what makes you a liquidity provider. If you're a liquidity taker, then you set the volume, but you're willing to bargain on the price. And that's when slippage can occur. So you can only have a, a slippage as a liquidity taker, not as a provider. Yeah, so the answer is no negative possible. So it's basically what is possible is partial fields, but there will not be slippage. Unless I understood uh, incorrectly, so maybe I'm, I'm just being thick here. But uh, it's very important that, that, that we understand the difference between a liquidity taker. As a taker, you know that the order will get filled, but you don't know at what price. And that's what the slippage is. Like slippage is a difference in the price that you actually get from the price you expect. As a provider, then you are actually negating the possibility that the price is different. You're saying either I fill at this price or I just don't do it. In which case, maybe only part of my trade might get done. Okay, so that uh, that was that. So times of execution, and just to to wrap up, uh, so an overview of the three execution types. Uh, and note these are like so the. Uh, the left-hand side would be like the, the, the prehistory. The ECN is like 1990s, uh, sorry, like 1900s, which is where the, the, the Forex world got stuck in terms of uh, clearing. And then there's an exchange, and there's a reason why uh, serious trading always happens on an exchange, because it's a lot less prone to manipulation. So and we're going to review the different options according to the four key characteristics. So how do you get to the market price? Is there a last look or not? Are trades anonymous, and is there the possibility of slippage? So, on a dealing desk, as we've said, it's a, the the price is set by one of the parties. In this case, the dealer. They they can obviously inform the price with what's going on in the real market, but ultimately the price is really whatever suits them. They they can always choose not to trade at the market price because they're the ones that are actually creating the market in the first place. The the customer in a in a dealing desk in a in a in a market making broker is a liquidity taker only then there's the possibility of last look uh, it's called a different thing it's called a requote so a requote is essentially when i offer to trade at a certain price but then when i'm uh, actually taken up on my offer i just renege on it and say well no i'm not going to do it at that price I, i'm going to do it at this other one uh, then of course there's no anonymity because both counterparties are trading directly with each other so everybody knows who they are uh, which can be used or which is information which can be valuable for for the stronger financially speaking party which is the the dealer and then the this uh, slippage so slippage does not exist in this situation because again it's uh, it's a choice of the dealer I, either they fill the volume or they don't 
but normally they uh, they don't uh, they don't fill you at a different price because then that's when you would be upset, right? That that would be a, a real joke. They they have to offer you the option of uh, they, they they requote, which is basically offering you the option to still stand by the deal even if at a different price. So with an ECN, so the price formation again, it's a uh, unilateral in the sense that it's a bargaining position between two parties in a bilateral relationship. There's a uh, last look in the sense that there's a, a the possibility of requoting or reneging on the on the on the on the deal as I, as I mentioned they could just pass it on to another lp it's non anonymous uh, in the sense that uh, still the counterparties are trading with each other of course it is an anonymous in the sense that say vlad could be trading with darwinx and darwinx will send vlad's trades to goldman sachs and goldman sachs will not know that it's actually vlad uh, that's uh, at the other end of the trade because they only see they're only facing Darwin X, but they still know it's Darwin X. And uh, and then uh, as I, uh, I said, so, so um, slippage is there because of course uh, the market depth is finite, and if you go with larger amounts, then uh, of course the 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 fill price will get worse and worse. Um, and of course, there's the, the 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 last look situation, which could make it uh, could delay the execution and therefore increase the the, the slippage. And last but not least, and actually the preferred option would be an exchange where everybody is contributing to the market price because everybody is trading against a central counterparty, a CCP, who's acting as the other side of uh, of everyone's trades. And th that means that all the trades by everybody are sent against all the trade by everybody, and everybody is trading on on one unique and say market price that's the key difference between forex and say you know FTSE futures uh, FTSE futures there's only one price that's what uh, that's the price listed by the exchange whereas with uh, you know the euro dollar there's one price at darwin x there's another price at the fxcm there's a price you know depending on where you are and how much you can bargain you get one price or the other and that's the key difference then there's no last look in an exchange. In an exchange, you put in binding orders, and uh, they are either filled or not filled. But there, th nobody can refuse to fill uh, a limit order that they had uh, they had entered into the system or, or risk it being expelled from from the order book. It is anonymous in the sense that the only person who knows the other counterparties is the central counterparty. So in this case, Vlad could trade against Goldman Sachs, but the Goldman Sachs would never know who's at the other end. It could be anybody because uh, it, it, it's always, uh, the, say, Elmax that's sitting in the middle. And um, and then the slippage, uh, there is slippage, and but basically every futures traders uh, knows that uh, slippage is, is part of, of, the, of the market and would never ever dream of um, blaming the, the broker for it because they know that's just how the market works. And if everybody could trade at the price they wanted, then everybody would be winning and that's just impossible. Okay. So yeah, that's pretty much the, the, the summary of uh, how orders get filled. And as you've seen, we've uh, not drifted, but actually gone onto other topics which are very much related to what goes on behind the scenes. And, uh, and have a real and long-term uh, influence on on how you on your experience as a as a trader. Uh, but with that, I basically we have come to the end of the of the planned uh, schedule for 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 the webinar. Uh, if you have any questions related to what we've discussed up to now, feel free to post them ahead now. I'll do my very best to answer. In the meantime, uh, let me remind you all guys that we're changing the server time this weekend. Uh, we will, from going forward, we will be in line with New York market close, and there will only be five daily candles in a week, as opposed to currently six, which uh, I think is a good step going forward. But it will require any uh, algo traders to adjust their EAs. Uh, so Hans is asking, can Darwinx make it possible to trade indices with smaller lot sizes? Uh, the answer is theoretically we could, but we would need to source the liquidity from a different liquidity provider. And the fact is, we're actually quite happy with the with the execution offered by by Elmax. So I don't think in the long in the short run, I don't think we're going to go for even smaller uh, lot sizes, unless Elmax offers something something uh, with, with smaller denom denominations. I mean, the tendency they, they do try to offer smaller and smaller contracts. For instance, uh, they've they've now offered uh, 0 0.01 ounces of gold, um, which wasn't uh, available up until a couple of months before. Only Saxo offered them. 
but I, I can't I can't speak for for LMAX. That's a question that we would have to pose to them. Typically, it's a lot harder to technologically to match very small order sizes because that, that requires the matching engine to work at a, a much higher speed. So there are technological limits to really matching the order sizes uh, on. On a, on a standardized uh, CFD. Of course, you can, uh, in that situation, dealing desk brokerages will, uh, or dealers will be in a superior position because they don't have that restriction of having to match everybody against everybody else. Uh, PPP is asking when this webinar will be online. And the answer is whenever we uh, stop here, I will upload the recording to uh, YouTube. You can uh, alternatively subscribe to the YouTube channel and you will be automatically notified whenever there's updates to on, on uh, webinars. So that's an option. So we come back to Rafael's question. So in, our, in my experience, is there a big difference between filling a trade with 0.1 lots and 5 lots or 10? Is this an extremely low difference for the market or does Darwin X widen the spread? So Darwin X does not widen the spread. Uh, we offer the spread that we get in the market uh, but let's see here. So you're talking about uh, five lots. So it, of course, it depends on which trade and so which pair and at what time. But normally, uh, five lots or ten lots is, is actually fine. Like uh, you, you within with ten lots, you're still at the top of the book, and the spread would be the same. If we were talking about a hundred lots, then that's a different situation. But as long as you stay below ten lots, normally you will be able to trade at the, at the top of the book. So, any more questions? Yeah, so uh, Coneco is saying that 100 lots can be easily traded by, by scaling. So, um, of course, that, that's the other point there. Yeah, that's a good point. So, uh, if you want to trade 100 lots, then unless your the execution is absolutely time critical, then you, you're probably better off breaking it up into smaller chunks of like 15, 20 lo lots each because uh, you will not uh, um, kind of eat into the order book as much by doing it that way, uh, the way you would if you did like 1,000 lots in one go. Like if you wanted to do 1,000 lots, then that would take some time to fill and you would experience significant slippage. And they're really optimizing the execution becomes a much more important point. Okay, uh, so there was a question by, who was it? Uh, how to tell if a broker doesn't trade against you. So uh, the best way to do so, if you're talking about an FCA regulated broker is to go to the FCA register. Uh, so I'm just gonna go to our site directly. This is the, uh, the Darwin X site on the FCA's register. And there you go, to the uh, permissions section, you find the permission to, for dealing in investments as a principal, this one. Uh, this is the, basically the permission to offer Forex trading. So uh, anybody regulated to act, act as a broker or a dealer of uh, Forex has to have a permission to deal in investments as a principal. Uh, because we're talking about an over-the-counter instrument. So the way it works is Darwinx as acts, even a broker like Darwinx acts as a principal by, say, Guy trades against Darwinx. Uh, Darwinx trades against Guy, but at the same time, as a match principle, Darwin X enters the opposite trade with Goldman Sachs. So uh, basically, our trade against Guy and our trade against Goldman Sachs cancel each other out. And therefore, Guy is trading directly against Goldman Sachs. And be, uh, you can be sure that we always act in this way because we have a limited license as a match principle broker. I'm just going to enter that here which means we are forced to clear each and every trade in the way I just described. So we trade on the one hand against our customers, but then we are forced to, at the very same time, trade against the market, which makes us a pure broker. So anybody who's offering Forex trading and carries the permission to deal in investments as principal and does not have the limitation uh, to be a match principal broker, anybody who doesn't have the limitation is is or has the option to trade against customers. And believe me, you have to carry a much higher um, capital to, to without this license. So if people 
do not have the restriction, they probably will use the privilege to trade against customers. So that's how you tell if a broker is trading against you or not. So in this case, this is not DarwinX, but the FCA telling Guy that DarwinX cannot trade against Guy. I hope that clarified that. If not, uh, anybody can write us at info at darwinx.com. And I will, uh, there's actually a blog post on, on this. You can uh, look it up on our blog. If you write to us, I will send you the URL because there's uh, details on how to do that. Okay, uh, sounds like we've uh, run out of, out of time and questions. So unless anybody has any additional question, we'll be closing, wrapping this one up. Uh, thank you so much for, for those who've uh, been here and stayed with us until the end. It's always a, a, a pleasure. So unless there's no one there, we're going to go in three, two, one. Wishing you everybody a nice weekend and uh, take care. Bye-bye.